This episode of Dorking Out is brought to you by... The Incom Corporation, makers of the T-65 Starfighter and now the T-70 Starfighter. The more we make, the faster we're free. Houston, flight is go. Myla, all is go. From Assignment X, Amalgamated Storytelling, and thesoniashow.com, it's The Dorking Out Show with Christopher Allen Smith and Sonia Mansfield. Welcome to Episode 64 of Dorking Out, a podcast for people who like to dork out about stories and the stories and culture that we love. That means movies and TV, books and podcasts, and everywhere else we find stories that interest us. This is the It Is Stephen King, Is It? edition. Uh, with me today, it is professional writer and author of The Sonya Show, a detailed love letter to the World War II era Japanese Mitsubishi KI-51 bomber. Google it. <laughs> I don't know any of those Sonya words. Sonya Mansfield. <laughs> hey, Sonya. Hey you really like that bomber. I sure do. You with me today blog. is my co-host, Emmy Award-winning filmmaker and compulsive liar, Christopher Allen Smith. One of those in things this, is true. In this week's episode, we review Stephen King's It, which scared up $117 million at the box office. I think that makes it like the second, high, was it the second highest grossing R-rated movie of all time? I believe the, it's number one. Deadpool? I think it might be number one, but I could be wrong because I didn't read any of the preparatory material. Because you don't read stuff. Anyway, (laughs) neither of us have read the book, so we brought in an expert, Margot D. from Book vs. Movie. She's a big Stephen King fan, so Margot is going to stick around for our second segment as well, where we share our favorite Stephen King adaptations. And finally, we will end our show with what we're dorking out about this week, another Star Wars movie another director firing. But does that mean things are back on track? All that and some Emmy preview talk after we get rolling. Hey, want more Dorking Out? Yep. You can visit our website at dorkingoutshow.com. You can. And you can like us on Facebook or follow us on Twitter. On Twitter. Do you listen to us on iTunes? Yep. It's cool. It's cool. We won't tell anyone. Nope. Please take a few minutes out of your busy day of pretending to work while you watch cat videos to give us a review on iTunes. Cat videos! For some reason, iTunes really cares about reviews and it helps us attract more listeners and you want us to have more listeners and be popular and cool, don't you? Yep. Of course you do. Yeah. And now, on with the show. Yeah. That brings us to our review of It with Margot D. from Books vs. Movie joining us today. But first, my long and rambly intro. Over the last 40 (laughs) years, Stephen King has quietly, but not too quietly, been one of the most influential storytellers in Hollywood. More on his body of work in Topic 2. But we say that as a setup to this weekend's monster, monster hit, It, and our review of It, Um, While Stephen King has made his name in horror, he's expanded out into all different directions of fiction and nonfiction and whatnot. What that leads to is a total lottery situation when it comes to his adapted works to the big screen. Sometimes we get a classic like Stand By Me or Shawshank Redemption or The Shining. And sometimes we get a Dark Tower or Sleepwalkers or Hearts of Atlantis. Uh, So what did we get with it? It is pure, uncut horror about a group of kids who discover, as you might expect, there is a supernatural evil at the heart of what appears to be their tranquil New England town. Joining us to discuss it and later talk about the towering figure Stephen King is in the world of storytelling is Margot D. from the Books vs. Movie podcast. And among other things, you, you've, you've done several Stephen King uh, associated episodes. Is that correct, Margot? Oh, yeah, there are plenty of them. I think there are about a couple of dozen of them there by now. Excellent. So <laughs> go over there if you want your, after after you listen to this, if you want your deep cut Stephen King adaptation discussions, Margot's got you covered. But what I want to start this out with, because I like to derail things right out of the gate. Yeah, good job, Smith. <laughs> is you have been doing a 
uh, episode-by-episode review of the TV version of The Mist, which, for my money, Frank Darabont's movie adaptation of The Mist is the most depressing movie I have ever seen. And I say that as someone who had to review Rob Schneider's Hot Girl. Margo, <laughs> is how is the mist is the mist worth watching? No, it is not. I can tell you that right off the bat. I, I feel the movie I, I like very much, even though that ending will fill you with complete despair. But I think the acting is good. I think the I think it was a strong adaptation. But the the Spike TV series of The Mist was ten episodes of a big nothing. It really it revealed nothing. The acting was all over the place. The writing was all over the place. It was a real disappointment. Uh, My friend Dina of the Twisted Philly podcast and I are both Stephen King freaks. My co-host Margot P doesn't like the Stephen King, the scary stuff. So I I brought my friend Dina to do it with me. And after a while, we would talk about the show for maybe 10 minutes and then just come up with our own Stephen King list just to keep ourselves (laughs) occupied (laughs) because we were just like, we couldn't deal with it. It was, it was that, it was that bad. All right. All right. Good to know. I just, I just, it's so funny because I haven't watched the movie or the show. And so I just assumed, oh, well, she must like The Mist because they're doing all these episode by episode <laughs> podcasts, but it's the opposite. Yeah. Okay. It was the good opposite. Know. Yeah. So yeah, we, we, we gave it a good chance, but, you know, we had to, after a while, like I said, we just came with our own list. And the lists are actually pretty fun to do. But I get the very end, I did a recap of the show for the last episode of the finale. And we both burst out laughing because it was so laughably bad and stupid oh, that we just wow. couldn't control ourselves. After 10 episodes, we we're like, I'm done. 10 hours. Of, you've taken my life. No. <laughs> oh, God, that is heartbreaking. All right. Well, too bad for that. Sonia, by the way, I will. the yeah. last thing I want to say about The Mist, the, Frank Darabont's The Mist is a movie that you cannot see. You cannot. I cannot. You cannot. Okay. You cannot see that movie. Because, I know because of the ending? Because the ending. Yes. Just don't. Okay. Just don't. All right. So I I am a bit of a sensitive flower that way. And we will get into that in this review. I'm sure that will (laughs) will break hearts of rock hard iron. That is a brutal, brutal ending. But enough about that. Let's talk about another brutalizing movie. It. (laughs) Uh, Margo, what did you think of this movie? So I'm a long time Stephen King fan. I'm a constant reader, as we call ourselves, or he dubs us. And uh, I, I watched the original 1990 miniseries many times. And I went in there cautiously optimistic. I thought maybe they're really going to do what they did with like Stand By Me and other Stephen King properties. And they came pretty damn close for, for me. I think they stuck right with the story, but they adapted in the right places. I think the acting is incredible. I don't, these, these kid actors were phenomenal. I, I, I worried about them. I, I, was, I loved watching them. I was moved. I watched the movie twice. You guys know this, but the audience doesn't. I watched it twice, too. <laughs> One day, then the next day. And, that is uh, dedication. I'm, total de- I'm totally dedicated and crazy. But I loved it. I, can't, I, can't, I don't know what to tell you. It's, are they perfect? Is it a perfect movie? No, but it's a great movie. And it's something I think I'm going to watch over the years. And I'm going to pick out things that I really enjoy about and scenes that I really enjoy. And it's going to be just like a part of my, it's in my top 10. I don't know if it's in my top five Stephen King films, but it's certainly in my top 10. So that's how I feel about it. Yeah. No kidding. Well, actually, okay, Sonia, actually, let's, let's, let's go on to you. What did, what did you think of it? So I have not read the book and I haven't seen the TV movie either. And I was very nervous about seeing this movie. Very nervous. Like the previews look really, really scary to me. And I am a sense, I can be a bit of a sensitive flower. So I was really nervous. I took my 15 year old niece with me and we went to the Alamo draft house where I had a beer. And I think that really helped. And (laughs) I really loved this movie. Oh, good. Really, really good. Like I, like I, I thought like, oh, I might have fun or I might really like it. Or yeah, I was kind of blown away by how much I really, really loved it. Like just really enjoyed it and thought it was really fun. And I've been trying to figure out, well, not well, fun in that it was kind of nice to be scared of something that wasn't the news. Yeah. <laughs> if yes. that makes sense. No kidding. Yeah. You know, yes. so I think 
the reason I've been feeling so ha- kind of strangely happy since I've seen the movie is I feel like it might have been therapeutic to see the movie and be scared of something else other than real life. I thought the clown is super creepy, obviously. And like Margot said, I thought the kids were really great. And I think even though it came first, I think things like Stranger Things and Mm -hmm. Super 8 have kind of laid the groundwork for a new version of this that I think really works. And I really, really liked it. I more than liked it. I loved it. And my niece thought it was amazing. Like she and she's read the book. She loves the TV movie, all of that stuff. So it was a big hit. Cool. And the, the crowd I saw it with was really into it. Yeah, same here. Yeah. I, it, saw, it at El- I saw it at Alamo Draft House as well. I'm sorry to interrupt. I, I saw it no, at good. Alamo Draft House as well. I was there on Friday afternoon at like 245 and there was there are people there like that brought balloons. They got they wore t shirts. <laughs> like they were into <laughs> it. It was hilarious. Actually, did lo- your did your sorry, Smith, I gotta ask. No, that's thing. okay. Keep did going. Did your did your screening have the like half hour of things before the movie? Yes, of course. Draft- yes. So you had like all the weird videos about clowns. Oh, and- about clowns and yeah. And then I, and the best thing about it is they play that. The, the, the voice it's a woman that left a voicemail and the, at the alamo draft house you can't text you can't use your phone to text or right. anything and oh, they threw yeah. her out and so she left this very vile message on their answering machine and called them you know a-holes and stuff yeah. like that so the audience was like clapping right from there like they were totally okay. in <laughs> yeah I, there was just before our screening they were showing all these clown videos and one of them was like a japanese game show or prank yes. show <laughs> And it was like a woman's like walking through a parking garage and then they have these like clowns come out and they scare her to the point where like she's on the ground and she's crying and begging for them basically not to murder her. And I was like, this is the worst thing I have ever seen. Oh, it's awful. It is is so mean. And I'm like, what is the show? Who is this for? It's terrible. It's awful anyway sorry smith that's okay now it's my turn to derail Uh, no 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 that's totally fine um well let me ask you this then because i i like this movie but i was I'll, i'll be honest i was shocked at how many people i live in uh northern california so i'm not kind of in a big city and they were playing this like every four you know there were showings like every half hour 45 minutes at this one theater i usually go to and it was sold out sold out sold out sold out it, yeah, it, this thing is a monster hit, and I, you know, I've read and liked Stephen King for nearly my entire life. I feel like I have a pretty good finger on the pulse of this kind of genre stuff. But this movie has taken off like a rocket. Is there was has there been quietly this kind of it fan base that I am just completely ignorant yeah. of, or what's the story there? I'm not going to say ignorant, but I think there's there is this it fan base. I mean, the book came out 30 years ago. It was a big deal. I was I was in high school, I think, back then, and mm-hmm. it, everybody had this book. 1,100 pages. Everybody read it. Everybody got freaked out by it. My own mother read it. It was a thing, and because it is whatever scares you. It's not really about the clown so much. Mm-hmm. And then all of a sudden, um, they had this TV movie, and it's fine for the time. It's not scary. I mean, I, I get really annoyed with people, especially around my age, like, oh, my God, that was the scariest thing ever. I'm like, oh, please, stop it. Watch it now. It's <laughs> right. terrible. It's bad effects. It's the acting is all over the map. But they really sanitized the story. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we like our scary Stephen King. You know, if Stephen King writes a scary story, do that. If he writes a story that's not scary but is, all, but is um, poignant, do that. You know what I mean? Like take the material yeah. and do, do what's intended with it. No, and they didn't do that with the TV movie. They made a very sanitized version, like I said. And so for a long, 27 years, there's been this thing. Like people are like, what if they actually made a scary clown? I love Tim Curry <laughs> as much as anybody. And he's doing the best he can with what he's got to, got to work with. But it ain't much, you know, right. and and so and also like, you know, the the, the money that they put into it and, and it's R rate. That's what got me excited when they say it was a rated R movie. I'm like, ooh, good. They're going to really rip his arm off. Yes. You know, right. yeah, because they don't make a lot of studios don't make a lot of hard R horror movies anymore, do they? It's mainly PG-13. Yeah. Or it's direct horror. video. Yeah, yeah, exactly. All right. Yeah, well, so that's, this is like a big, big budget horror movie that I just 
I can't remember the last really big budget horror movie. Well, we're going to get a lot more now because this thing is. Yeah, this, I think you're right. Yeah, well, it's funny because I, as we were doing prep for the show, I was um, going over some of the news having to do with, you know, how well it's doing at the box office. And there was a thing in Variety that said, you know, what the Dark Tower could have learned from it. And the first, you know, five things the Dark Tower adaptation could have learned from the it adaptation. And number one is just adapt, just adapt the book. Don't get all clever and reread <laughs> right. it. Don't just, like, don't just make up a story. You, you got Stephen King. Just adapt his book. And yeah. then and then number two was lean into the R. If it's R, it's Stephen King. People are right. expecting crazy horror. Really go at it. And if and if you if you PG thirteen the movie, it's gonna bleach it out. And I think I think it's interesting that you're talking about because this is this was a very scary, very crazy. Mm-hmm. Pretty horrifying movie, and I can, I looked at the iTunes preview of the Tim Curry version uh, earlier today, and it was like, wow, that's that's early '90s TV. Look at that, and it's just, I can't network imagine TV. That's, yeah, exactly. Yeah, network, network. I can't TV. imagine. Like, of course, it's not going to be that scary, right? So I can't imagine having to wade through two nights of that. <laughs> but this is well, you know, our, it was our fine. It was nineteen ninety. There was not yeah. that much on back then. I mean, that's true. It, that's true. You know, it's the same network that bought Twin Peaks. So I thought that they would be a little more daring with it. But they took a thirteen hundred page book, or excuse me, eleven 1, hundred page book, and they made three hours out of it. And you just right. can't do that. You miss so much because of that. But I think at the time, also Stephen King movies did okay at the box office, but not like you know, it was mid nineties. All of a sudden, we had Shawshank Redemption, The Green Mile. You know, movies like that, Misery, right. we had Misery, and Dolores Claiborne, like, these movies were really good, and they brought an audience. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, that that is the thing, as I remember back in the 80s, is, you know, sometimes you'd get a Dead Zone, and sometimes you'd get a Creep Show 2. Pet Cemetery. Or yes. Pet Cemetery. <laughs> yeah. Even yeah. though, <laughs> let's, not, let's, not, let's not necessarily kick around Pet Cemetery for reasons that will become clear for Sonya later. Oh, um. okay. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I did want to. I wanted to mention that uh, our podcasting friend Dana Buckler was supposed to come on and also talk about it with us, and he yes. just did a really great episode about the original TV movie It on his podcast. How is this movie? Yes. Mm-hmm. So everybody should listen to it. And of course, he talks about you as well, Margot. Sounds like you were very instrumental in putting that episode well, together for him. So right. did either of you read the book It? No, but I, know I you didn't son. I was just I, look, I, I I was just looking at my Audible account and apparently I've purchased it and downloaded it at some point. But I have not <laughs> oh, wait, actually We're going to hear uh, Stephen Weber read it to you then. That's correct. Um, yeah. yeah, so it's so it's a great book. It's so it, let me just give you some context. In the mid 80s, Stephen King had a raging alcohol and drug problem. Alcohol and cocaine specifically every single day and cigarettes. Like that's how he just like you know, motivated himself every day. And he sometimes, he though, he directed Maximum Overdrive, which is another like crazy, right. bad, <laughs> nutty movie that doesn't make sense. That's Around okay. these times, he's directing that. So he, he's, you know, as he's making Maximum Overdrive, he's also finishing It. And It, the last third of the book, especially the, when they're, you know, vanquishing with the demons, uh, it gets really insane. And there's particularly a scene that's very controversial that, um, and they've been mentioning this in different articles, but that, Bev, the one girl of the group of the Losers Club, basically has sex with all the boys. And Holy that's how smokes. they vanquish the spider. That's very true. I and heard that on the show, and I was like, what the yeah. F? <laughs> and, that's, and that's something. So, oh, of course, they didn't do that, the ABC version. And then when, this, they, when it became a movie and we realized it was going to be a hard R, Stephen King fans are like, uh, well, what does that mean exactly? But they said, absolutely not. We're not going to include that. So if you haven't seen the movie yet, don't worry. <laughs> that's yeah. not there. Because that's King probably a deal breaker. I'm sure oh, it's absolutely. a deal breaker for some people are like, no, thanks. No, thank but, you. Yeah. yeah. So it's so anyway. Yeah. So Dana had me on to talk about that. So it's, it's in the in the back in the movie. It ends with a big spider and the slingshots are used. And it's, it's very dated because it takes place in the late 50s. So the, so the fact that I love the fact that they moved it to 1989. I just love that that's like a great year to settle it. And the kids are a little more mature. I like that they talk like kids. You know, they're foul yeah. mouthed and moody. 
and impatient and mm -hmm. they yell at each other. Like that's how kids talk. Yeah. And it I is just, how they talk. It is how they talk. And I just, I bet your, is it your niece that you took? Yeah. She's 15. I, I bet she loved it. She did. She, she loved this movie and she loved all the kids in the movie. I, I think she really did relate to it. Yeah. I, they, they seem like real kids to her. I mean, they are definitely like 80s kids, but she found it really relatable and she was just blown away by the movie. She super loves it. Yeah. She no, wants yeah. to go see it again. And I'm like, you're not alone because apparently Margot went out. And yes. Saw it. The next day. <laughs> no, She'll probably make her mother take her again. It's a, yeah, no, it's it's fantastic. It, it, and maybe I think I might be in the minority. I mean, I did find it scary and kind of creepy, but I thought the parts that I liked the most were kind of just when the kids were hanging out or trying to figure stuff out. Once they yeah. started once they started to kind of confront the things that were scaring them, sometimes it was creepy, sometimes it was just kind of it it almost seemed like and talk to me about this, Margot. The it almost seemed as though Stephen King was just kind of grabbing and whatever he could think of, whatever weird thing he could think of for this kid or that kid, he would kind of throw it at the wall. I mean, isn't he kind yes. of isn't he kind of famous for having a premise, starting a book, and then kind of making up it, making it up as he goes along with no he, real end game at in sight. If he ever said to me, like if I ever met the man, and he looks me in the eye and says, "You know what? I work from an outline." I would laugh my head off. Because yeah. I'd be like, oh, BS. Absolutely no way. No way. He, but he even says that he just, he gets a germ of an idea and he wakes up every day. By the way, the man writes every, a, a drug addict, alcoholic, whatever. He writes every single day. He's been off drugs, by the way, since like 1990, but he's still very productive. But that's just how he rolls. He doesn't have, he's not like a JK Rowling who had all of Harry Potter planned out, you know, years in advance. Like he's the opposite of that. He right. has an idea and he just rolls with it. And he has just a crazy imagination. And thank God for that. I think it's, it's, he's a fun read. You know, you don't know what you're going to get. <laughs> he is. And I think that's the thing that for my money makes him so special and that I really like about him is that my experience with a lot of his books is I like the first two thirds of them. And then mm -hmm. the last third, they kind of, kind of spin out of control or he, for some reason, that f brings it home in the last third. And when he does that, the experience of reading him when it's great from start to finish and he land sticks the landing, there's few things in pop culture storytelling that I enjoy more. Um, I which, agree. Which I, I, which is kind of like, I liked this and there were moments that were kind of creepy and scary, but I think for me, Stephen King's creepiest villains are never the supernatural ones. They're always the humans. Oh, um, yeah, the bullies. Yeah, the bullies or the whatever. And the, a lot of that stuck true. And then, the you know, the messed up parents and the whatever. And yeah. there's a lot of that here. And, yeah, I mean, I liked it. But for me, this I, – I think I might be with you, Margo, in that this – I really liked it, but it didn't enter the top tier of Stephen King ad adaptations for me. And I, I can't quite put my finger on it, but – hanging out with those kids and I, I'm interested and I'm a little baffled not a lot of storytelling deals with kids like this when we all know kids are exactly like this this is how right. kids really act you know but we almost never see it on screen and you know we between this and uh, Stand By Me or it seems like S Stephen King has this perfect knack of hitting that age correctly and really making it great. I have to say, like, the, I think, you know, it is obviously scary, and, and Skarsgård is a, is a fantastic clown. You know, yes. he's just brilliant. But I have to say, I thought the second scariest person was Henry Bowers, who is this teenage thug. That, yes. You know, he, he cuts into the kid's stomach, and he's terrifying. And I looked him up. He's 17 years old. His name is Nicholas Hamilton. He's Australian. Like, he's not even American. That kid just acted like he's this kid from Maine, like this redneck from Maine with his mullet and everything. And he's very, he and his two thugs were very scary to me. When they were walking in the halls and they threatened them, I got really nervous. He yeah. made me very nervous when he said the cat was his new target. Oh, no, no, I know. I screamed out loud. <laughs> yeah. Now I'm like, cover, you know, I'm like covering my eyes and I'm like, Lorelai, tell me when the cat stuff's over because <laughs> it started to make me really nervous. But what's creepy about him is like, 
I know kids like that. Like I've seen yep. kids like that, you know, they weren't my friends, they were bullies, but they, it's a real, that's a real monster. Yes. Is a kid like that to, to a kid that age. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And I, yeah, I, 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 oh, keep going, Sonia. I was just going to say so many movies make kids little adults. Like they're way more thoughtful and smart than real kids. Yeah. You know, and I felt like these are real kids. Exactly. Yeah. And that's the, that's the, the, I think that's the, my favorite part of this movie or that maybe it's just that I just don't get it enough in movies. And I love that kind of learning process where, you know, the kids are, they're not adults yet. They can kind of see adulthood coming at them, but they're, there's still a lot of childlike qualities with them. And they're in this really kind of no man's land, melancholy place. And I think you're right. Almost all of pop culture kids are sanitized, happier, sweeter, nicer version of kids. I mean, it's funny. I was, as we were thinking about this and I was thinking about watching these kids try to figure out this mystery, I would kill for a treatment of Harry Potter where the kids were actually acted like kids and were not kind of like <laughs> idealized students. I mm -hmm. would. So somebody in our listening audience, please rewrite the entire Harry Potter <laughs> Saga. Oh come on! So want, I can you want a, so I can experience so that. Funny. You want a grim, dark Harry, like more grim, more dark Harry Potter, kind of like they and did dumber? with Batman. Not, and not dumber. a more not a more grim and dark, but just kind of like you know, you know, Malfoy does something more than just kind of scowl at him across the classroom. This isn't your. It's not your mama's Harry Potter. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> so um, I guess we're all pretty high on uh, it. Yeah. yeah, you know, I I saw some tweets going around where people were talking about that it's not really a horror movie, that it's just this crazy drama that happens to have a creepy clown. Oh, and whatever. I know, and I think it's like it's just another example of the well, if something's really good, then it can't be a horror movie, which right. I think is just BS. Yes. Yeah. You know, and I'm like, That's no, snobbery. this is a full on horror movie. A kid's arm gets ripped off. Yeah, this is in a the first scene. <laughs> That's right. Blood comes gushing out of a bath, you know, about how, how, wow, that is some weird gatekeeping right there. I know. So, um, is, so, all right. So Margo on a scale yes. of one to 10, Sonia loves this question. So I'm going to let her think about question. it. You love it on a scale of one to 10, 10 being the shining, I guess, maybe what <laughs> would you, what would you give it? Eight or nine. All right. Okay. Sonia Mansfield? I am the same. All right, Eight or, cool. Yeah, I'm I gonna, really liked it. I'm going to definitely see it again. I'm, I'm going to see it again, too. Excellent. I'm going <laughs> to give it a third, seven, third seven or an eight. Charm. I'm gonna be, no, because there's a scene that I didn't catch that's either time, and it's when the boy's in the library and he's flipping through the book. Ben is flipping through the book, and right. apparently there's a creepy lady in the corner over his shoulder the whole time he's flipping, and I've missed that, and I've seen a picture of it. Now I need to see it again. Oh. So... Yes, you will see me at Alamo Draft House again. I'll wait like a week or two, but I'm definitely going to see it again. <laughs> All right. Let's go on then. Now that we've kind of talked through this one Stephen King story, let's go to the wider world of Stephen King adaptations up next. This segment is brought to you by Paranoia. Do you want to be worried, but everything is going just fine? Then you need Paranoia. While Stephen King has been the undisputed king of the bestseller list since the 1970s, the era which saw Brian De Palma make King's first book carry into a horror classic, a veritable trainload of movies have been based on King's stories, not all of them screaming Stephen King horror master. Among these good movies and classics are Stand By Me, Apt People, Shawshank Redemption, The Green Mile, Misery, even the much derided Arnold Schwarzenegger's camp action flick, The Running Man. Added to these are undisputed horror classics like The Shining, Dead Zone, as well as a huge number of middling horror movies like Firestarter, The Mist, Cujo, Needful Things, Children of the Corn, Hearts of Atlantis, and the recent adaptation to television or the internet, Hulu. What's Hulu? Is it TV? Internet? I don't know. Point is, 112263. 
That is a lot and of stuff. That's a lot of stuff. And while we love a lot of these stories, we thought it would be good to have Margot stick around and we'll try to tackle the big task of naming our favorite Stephen King adaptations. It's a big task because he's written, I think we, I figured it out to be about 90 books, including his like novellas and all that. And his work has been adapted more than 60 times, but maybe three or four of those are different ad- adaptations of Carrie. That's an insane amount of stories. I don't want to waste too much time talking about how crazy it is that Stephen King has written so many books while I'm still struggling to write one. You're not alone. Because that's, because that's a segment for another time. Let's just dive right in and talk about our favorites. Uh, I'm going to let our guest go first. Margo, what is one of your favorite Stephen King adaptations? One of my all-time favorites is The Dead Zone. And I love the movie and especially what's going on in the world right now and the person in charge right now (laughs) (laughs) i like the subplot of the dead zone very much right now but i also really love the tv series too i thought that was really interesting the first couple of seasons anyway so that's my first one that's a really good one i love christopher walken oh he's great that could have very easily have been on this list uh i could have also very easily put the movie we just reviewed on our list it Mm -hmm. but i'm not going to put it on my list um, and I, I really did try to go a little deeper with my picks, but I can't make a list like that, this and not put The Shining on my list. So The Shining is on my list. It is one of my favorite horror movies. It scares the crap out of me every time I see it. And I think because the reason it scares me so much, and Smith, you kind of touched on this in topic one, was the idea of the human monster. Kind of the idea that like your husband would turn into something crazy like that and try to kill you is very scary to me. (laughs) (laughs) Well, having met Sonia's husband, (laughs) this is an appropriate fear. I mean, really, oh my God, he's like the nicest man on the planet. That's right. I'm in, I'm in the minority that thinking that he is a potential murderer, but there it is. (laughs) Uh, No, that's great. I, you know, I think that's the thing is I really like that whole thread, but then there's the whole kind of psychic thread in that movie that right in the in the weird hotel it's kind of like going in a million different directions at once and it does feel weird for me to not exactly be criticizing a Stanley Kubrick movie, but just I, I that that I like that movie, but it's never hit me yeah. the way you know what that I usually it, get hit. I think it it also has to do I mean it still scares me when I watch it now but I remember seeing a preview for The Shining in front of Star Trek the original motion picture oh, my dad yeah. my dad oh, wow. took me to see it and it's just the preview where like the elevator opens ding and like yeah. all the blood rushes out that scared the crap out of me as a kid <laughs> why <And> just, <laughs> why <laughs> What are you it's kidding me? So, so disturbing. And I think it just always stuck with me, that that feeling. And so maybe it's a bit of a nostalgic pick. Yeah. No, I, I definitely get that. Um, well, because Margot has such fantastic taste, <laughs> she has a lot of my movies on her list. But because I'm a good host, co-host, uh, yeah, Dead Zone, loved it. Um, I, I like it that it's, uh, not Christopher Walken being crazy Christopher Walken. He's kind of down and subdued and, and Mm -hmm. the the realization that, oh, I see this thing. I know what this guy's going to be. And he's kind of in this awful situation where do I have to be what appears to the outside world, this lone crazed assassin and only, only I will know if I have saved the world or not, and I will be destroying my reputation and breaking the hearts of everyone I love if I do this, but it's just, it's a fantastically, that's the thing about Stephen King that I love the the most is he's got these fantastic human characters. And then when he brings in the creepiness, it just, that's why I think he hits people like a ton of bricks. I mean, there's a reason he's, is he is, correct me if I'm wrong. He's, he's like the biggest horror author or, or probably the biggest, fictional author of the last 40 years am i right in those numbers he's he uh, jk rowling is actually she sold more than him right um, but i think the number one is agatha christie believe it or not 
Still? I think she, yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> still? She, she still <laughs> s- sells a ton of books. I used to work in the book uh, publishing world, so... Yeah, but Stephen King, yeah, he, he he will never go without a meal. I mean, he he's done okay for himself. And he's remained, a, by all accounts, a very nice man and very philanthropic and very encouraging of young filmmakers. And he, if you're a college student and you're a, a film student and you want to adapt one of his works, he will charge you $1 to do so with the That's- proviso that you can't release it to the world, but he'd like to see a copy. But if you're a film student and you want to do that for your thesis or whatever, he'll sell it to you for a dollar. That that's what I've heard. That is fantastic. I might have to make yeah. a movie. That is so generous. Yeah, I know. Don't you want to do that now? <laughs> I kind of do. Just for the just for the excuse to talk, talk to him. But um, anyway, my pick is Apt Pupil, which I think is kind of in the middling range of uh, his adaptations. Brian Singer before I think it was after Usual Suspects, but before he got going on the X Men. Um, Ian McKellen plays a what may or may not be a concentration camp guard it's living next door in this s- suburban American town. And it's just, it's a simple thing where the kid next door begins to suspect who she is. That's all the story is. There's nothing supernatural. There's nothing crazy. It's just what would happen if this monster lived next door and you were the only one that knew. And it's, uh, and our kind of fascination with evil and we kind of have, sometimes find it interesting to think about people that are evil or do evil things and ask them questions and figure it out. And it's just, it is a very creepy, fantastically chilling movie, I thought. But so apt people is my, I don't think I've seen that one actually. It's good. I know what it is, but I have, well, I hope it's good. I haven't seen it in a while. (laughs) Yeah. I think it is. I think it might be. I have to be honest. I have to be honest. I haven't seen it in a while. I did l- listen to it, and I think. Correct me if I'm wrong, Margo. If you know this, wasn't at pupil one of the short stories in the same collection as the body and uh, the Shawshank? Shawshank. Redemption? Yes, it is. It's in uh, different seasons. Right. And there's four stories, and one of them is the breathing method, which is going to be a movie coming out, which is really. I forbid you, Sonia. You're not allowed to read this book. You're not allowed to see the movie when it comes out. I'm just telling you right now. Wow. You cannot. It will freak you out. But that's where we have The Body, which is my second favorite movie, Stand By Me. And that's where we also have Shawshank Redemption, and we have Apt People. So, yes, right. you are right, Smith. Thank you. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, so basically, I definitely won't read or see that other one then. So the pound. breathing method. I'm telling you now. I forbid you. <laughs> so okay. p- pound for pound then uh, – Maybe it's just my own personal predilection, but pound for pound, different seasons is his best book. Look at what I came out so. of that. Oh yeah, so. he writes great shorts. I love his short stories and I love his novellas. I mean, I also love his big sprawling works too. But he he's so talented. I mean, he can kind of pretty much do it all. Yeah. Gosh, you know what? Maybe that's it. Maybe when he writes a novella, it's like he's got to be concise. He's got to be tight, yeah. and his you know, uh, drawbacks or his bad habits or something don't really have time to break out of the cage and sprawl all over the book. Maybe that's what it is. Maybe that's why. All right. Anyway, sorry. I'm off on a tangent. Uh, Margo, what, <laughs> what is your, what is your next, what is your next one? So it's stand by me. Um, I believe it came out in 1986. If I'm correct. I just, yep. it's another case. It's just, it's a story about kids and they're lost, lonely kids. They're all kind of misfits And they go at this adventure together. And it's a wacky premise. I mean, they heard there's a dead body, a kid that was hit by a train. And they hear that it's out there. And they just have to see it. Because they're kids and it's summer. They're bored. You know, they have all this time to do things and explore things. So they go out on this overnight journey. And they become different people by the end of it. And you just, you, you, I think Corey Feldman, you know, for all of his wackiness Mm. as an adult, He's brilliant in this movie. There is yeah. nobody else who could play that part like him. He's, he was a great young actor. And Will Wheaton is there. River Phoenix. Oh, you know, yeah. Just oh, heartbreaking. So, it's so heartbreaking. You know, he's, he died just a few years later. And um, Jerry, I'm sorry, Jerry uh, O'Connell mm-hmm. is yeah. in there. It's one of Rob Reiner's best movies, if not his best film. I think it's just, it, it's just it's a perfect film. There's no scene I would take away from it. 
It's the, it's just, it ends beautifully. Richard Dreyfus does the voiceover and normally I hate voiceovers, but he's great in that part. Um, I just love it. I just, I, every time I watch it, it just takes over. I just, it just seeps into my pores. You know what I mean? Yeah. I just, I just love it. Is Keeper is Sutherland name? one of the villains? Yeah, he is. Yeah. He's ace, ace. He's the, he's the it's mean guy. It's such a good movie. Great movie. You know, That's it's fun. awesome pick. It's funny because when you when you talk about Corey Feldman, Sonia and I have talked about this kind of uh, when we talk about the Oscars, like ways to improve the Oscars and where they really uh, honor artistic achievement and everything. Because sometimes it it is has this uh, popularity contest aspect in it when you're only <laughs> narrowing it to one year. Which is fine. I mean, that's the way award shows are. But, you know, one of the discussions that we've had from time to time is kind of like like the 10-year Oscar where you look back <laughs> and kind of yeah, like hard. what, what yeah. stood the test of time that we missed. And as soon as you said Corey Feldman, it's like, yeah, that performance in, in a just world where great acting performances yeah. were honored – Corey Feldman in Stand By Me would have something because that is just a really heartbreaking, really sad, and it's it's so, yeah, heartbreaking because you can you can see he's a good kid with a good heart that's not gonna grow up right because of where right. he started and what his influences are, and you can see kind of the potential being lost, and it's just sad, it's, but it's and so it's, and it's like bittersweet, it's true to life, yes. Because so, because as a character, his father stormed the beaches of Normandy, and basically the man has PTSD, right, is what we would right. say now. But he beats the crap out of this kid, basically. And he walks around on eggshells around his father, who he loves very much, but he's being abused by him. And at the same time, Corey's a young actor. We found he, we find out later on, he admitted he was being abused by people he trusted right. in the show business. So that's, I think, part of the performance. He's like drawing from real life, which you really want to feel sad, like really kind of take that in like wow this kid has to act this and live it and right. it's 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 heartbreaking it, it's i don't know anybody else who could do that part as well as he could i mean he yeah. just he's so good yeah definitely definitely such a good pick sonia mansfield what's your next pick okay you guys can make fun of me but i think pet cemetery is really scary <laughs> <laughs> i it's the only stephen king book i read like my, my sister is a really big uh, Stephen King fanatic and she's read all the books and she's like, you might like Pet Cemetery. You should read it. So I read it and I thought it was really, really scary. And then Pet Cemetery played at the movie theater I was working at. So I was like, well, I could see it for free. So I saw it and I thought it was really scary. <laughs> it's scary. Now, to be fair, I haven't watched it recently because I know that the little boy getting killed would make me cry for a week. Yeah. But I was really scared in this movie. I thought it was really, uh, there's some stuff in it that's pretty gross. If I remember correctly, where they cut his like, who's, who's tendon is it? Oh, uh, oh, oh, there was it the father. No, no, no. It was Fred Gwynn. I think. It yeah. Was Fred oh, yeah. yeah. So, gr so gross. Like I just, this movie really, really scared me. And I had to put it on my list. So and the it, Ramones and do the song. It, I'm sorry. Yeah, that's right. The Ramones do the song. And it was played over the credits, so I cleaned many a theater to that song. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to get buried in a pet, a pet cemetery. cemetery. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I have to admit, I've never seen that movie. What? I've never seen Pet I, Cemetery. I totally acknowledge that it might be quite stupid, but for whatever reason, Pet Cemetery really scared me when I saw it. Cool, 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 cool. Um, next, to keep things moving along, I'm going to go with my next one. 11 63 which is, I can't believe this book hasn't been written before he wrote it. This is one of those right. books that as soon as I heard he was writing it, I was so excited to uh, hear about it or to, to read it and then watch the James Franco miniseries on Hulu, which is, it's a very simple premise. Any Anybody who's daydreamed about time travel has probably thought about this, which is, what if you could go back in time and stop the assassination of JFK? What would that be like? And it's just so, well, th for me, this has everything that a Stephen King 
story has both good and bad, which is a fantastic premise, fantastic characters, a really deeply thought out and nuanced kind of thing, um, nuanced uh, examination of the characters and the problems that they have and how somebody would really try to live through the situation. But then there's also this strange thing, and this was more the book's fault than the miniseries, which is somehow time is fighting back against him like it's this spectral whatever. And so when he, there, so there's when he changes time, there's these weird earthquakes and stuff. So it's kind of like, wait a minute, how does stopping a president from getting killed start earthquakes that destroy the world thirty years later? I don't, I don't know exactly how that works. So I would say this is eight tenths of a fantastic story. And if you could just kind of skip over the last part, um, that's fine. But Margo, you were mentioning something about this earlier, weren't you? Yeah, it's it's one of my favorite adaptations as well. And I, I felt the same way you did. I mean, because I'm kind of a history geek. And when I found out this was the premise for his book, I'm like, why didn't somebody think of this sooner? Because, yeah, it, and it, and then you get in the Stephen King version of that. So it's going to be great and creepy. And I, I loved this series very, very much on Hulu. And I think it's like James Franco's, some of his best work is there. And it's got a great cast. And it, it's very scary in some spots. And it's I loved it. Yeah, it's fantastic. Now, there might be another movie that I would mention, but Margot is going to mention it here, which might be the greatest movie on any of these lists. It's got to be Shawshank Redemption. And I know it's like the easy thing to say, you know, because everyone says that one, but it holds up. I watched it recently uh, for another podcast and just from beginning to end, the uncut version, all of it. And it's a long movie. It's a big journey. It's a long journey that you're on, but it's so well cast. I think that Morgan Freeman is like the anchor of that film. I think him is red. I think him, he and Tim Robbins have great chemistry. I, I just, I, I adore this movie. And I, I, when it comes on TV, I'm one of those people. Why do they have Shawshank Redemption on again? Because somebody like me will find it and we'll yeah. stick there. Yeah, Look, sit on the there's couch and never, watch it. There's never a time when this movie isn't on TV. Yeah, like it's I know. always, it is always on and when I see it's on, it's the same thing. I'm like, oh, Shawshank's on. Oh, it's the opera scene. I have to watch that. And then after yeah. that, I'm, I'm totally in. Then I got to watch yeah. it to the end. Yeah. And I, yeah. I just loved it. Yeah. The, well, the yeah. End, I've never seen that in the theater and just sobbing at the end. Me too. Yeah. Me too. Like <laughs> sitting in the theater through the credits, just. <laughs> <laughs> it's so emotional. Yes. It is. It is so great. Now, correct me if I'm wrong. This movie did not do that well at the box office. Is that no, right? No, and it's funny. It came out the same year as Dolores Claiborne. I don't know if that did that well either, but it was one of those slow burners kind of thing. Like, it just sort of caught on. I think when it, at this is at the time. I think when it came out on VHS, mm-hmm. and that that's when it kind of caught on. I think for some reason they made it a summer release, if memory serves. I think you're memory right. Memory is a funny thing. Yeah. I, so I think it, like, came out on VHS, then people started watching it, and then all of a sudden, like, oh, my God, this is brilliant. Yeah, it's a fantastic... Yeah, I remember I was, like you guys, lucky enough to actually see it in the theater, and oh, my God. Gosh, you know what? Now that I think about it, Fathom Event should put that one back out. I would love to see that on the big screen again. But, I think yeah. it would do well, too. Yeah. Oh, 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 my God. Now that you mention it like that, that would be a monster hit. Yeah. All right. Anyway. Sorry, Sonya Mansfield, what's your next one? Yes. Okay, here's another one where everyone can laugh at me because I don't think this one's probably aged well, but I can't lie. I have, uh, this is a nostalgic pick. I uh, really love The Running Man. <laughs> <laughs> I watched it a lot. I, I watched it a lot. I love, I I love how Margo's laughing at you. <laughs> she should <laughs> laugh. <laughs> she should <laughs> laugh. I deserve to be laughed at. Uh. <laughs> We covered this on book versus movie, by the way. Like, well, if you look at our library, that's one of the ones I made fun of the most. I'm you sorry. should. You should make fun of it because I acknowledge, like, it's, it's yeah. not a very good movie. I just happen to really like it anyway. I think. Of course. I watched it a lot in the in the 80s with my dad. So I think, once again, it's Aww. probably a nostalgic pick. But I just think it's really fun. And honestly, like. I'm not quite sure that like reality game shows really aren't that far off from this. like this is actually probably something that could happen. Yeah, I think you're right. Yeah. So 
you know, maybe in that way, it's been able to predict the future. I just find it like, I mean, this is like peak 80s Arnold Schwarzenegger. Like, yeah, this is total yeah. meathead Arnold. It is a really enjoyable, like, not scary at all <laughs> Stephen <laughs> King movie. Not even remotely scary. It has like a man in like a light up suit named Dy- Dynamo or whatever. All that yes. stuff. Is so, it's all so stupid. I realize that, but I still think the movie's super fun. <laughs> It is fun. I think it should be rebooted, though. I think it was, yeah. I think you get a serious That's director one that would with make it. A, yeah, it would make an excellent remake. Mm-hmm. Oh, my God. I just That's I right. super love. I don't know why. There's just something about it. That's when I it's another one that if I see it's on, I was like, oh, cool. Running man's on and everyone else is all ew and leaves the room. But I really like it. <laughs> yeah, like it would have been easy for me, honestly, to put Carrie on this list as well. But. I had to be honest. And I was like, uh, if I put rewatchability on this list, the truth is I watch The Running Man way more than I watch Carrie. Is Running Man? Really? Although, although Carrie's really good, obviously. You know what? I think maybe it's that I have a uh, – I was going to say Ar- Arnold Palmer uh, problem, but maybe I have a <laughs> Brian De Palma problem. You have, you have an Arnold Palmer That's problem. <laughs> is, I don't really like Carrie that much. I don't I, I don't get it. Like I love that movie. Yeah, I love I'm it sorry. too. It's just not one that I go back to and rewatch as often as The Running Man, strangely. Right. But well, I mean, the reason Carrie's been adapted like four times. Like it's the story that so many yeah. people can relate to. So it definitely needs to be on the list. Definitely. It's so, in my top ten. Yeah, for sure. So Margot, what is your what is your last one, I guess, is what we're My last about. one, um, I just mentioned it. I saw it the same year I saw Shawshank Redemption, which is the year I moved to New York. Oh, I graduated from San Jose State, and I moved to New York in 95. Um, Dolores Claiborne. I love that movie. It's Kathy Bates. It's Jennifer Jason Leigh. It's a fantastic story. It, it's filmed in Halifax, Nova Scotia. It's just this dark, deep mystery. You know, the bad, there's nothing supernatural going on. And David Strathern's in there, and he plays a bad guy. And, and it's just this, it's a murder mystery with this mother-daughter relationship that's fraught versus uh, coming over, getting over a terrible childhood and a bad marriage and all this stuff together. It's very gothic. Right. And it's, it's, one, it's one of my least favorite stories to read because if you read the original novel, it's written in a dialect that's very uh, old school New England, mm-hmm. and there are no chapters She's just, Dolores Claiborne is just talking. And it's so frustrating to read because I just, I don't have that ability to speak New England, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so, but, but I always, I try to be a completist. I try to see his movies when they come out. So I went to see it. I was completely knocked out. It's a great story. I watched it again recently. My friend, like I said, Dina of Twisted Philly, we talked about it on, our, on uh, Book versus Movie. And it, it really holds up. It's, it's a beautiful film, fantastic performances. And I don't know, it just really gets to me. I don't watch it all the time, but every once in a while, I kind of, on, on like a dark, cold, stormy day kind of thing, I like to watch it. So that's that's mine. Dolores Claiborne. You know yeah. what? It, it's definitely been overshadowed by misery, yes. I think. Like that's the one that every like Kathy Bates, Stephen King, misery. And yes, this one doesn't get the the attention it deserves because it's an awesome movie. This yeah. was on, woman, this was on my original list, too. Yeah. And this, it's a woman named Judy. I'm sorry. A woman named Judy no, Parfit. She plays Vera. And Vera is like the villain and also the hero at the same time. Like she's like Dolores's boss, like mean boss. But she's also her savior at the right. same time. And it's a fantastic performance. And that was her first movie appearance. And Taylor Hackford directed the film. And he's married to Helen Mirren. And Judy was a London stage actress and didn't think she would ever be in Hollywood or be in a big production. And she has a very good career after that. But that's her first film. And she's like 56 or something. So anyway, that's uh, it's, I'm, t- I'm giving you more trivia than you want to hear probably. But, no, no, no. Yeah, that's great. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I, I'm, I'm, I'm very happy that you said that because I'll be honest. I think I kind of forgot about Dolores Claiborne. And as soon as you mentioned it. I think a lot of people it, have. Yeah. yeah. And I, as soon as you mentioned it, I remember that, that year specifically thinking, wow, that's a really good movie. Like it kind of snuck up on me. And yeah. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna see that again. That's you uh, should. It, it holds up. Yeah, excellent. I just remember seeing it and thinking, why is no one talking about this one? Yeah, yeah I thought the because same way. Because it was so good. Yeah, 
definitely. So um, I think my last one is, I guess, kind of to be expected, Misery. Um, <laughs> which is, I mean, it's good. It's just a nice, tight little, it, it a nice, tight little creepy movie of just, now that I'm thinking about it, except for 11, 22, 63, all, all of mine don't have any supernatural aspect to them at all. It's just when people get twisted and mean and weird, and I'm not sure anybody writes twisted, mean, weird characters better than Stephen King. Um, <laughs> and this is for anybody that doesn't know, this is the story of a super fan. God, can you imagine what she would do with the internet now? Sorry, anyway. <laughs> this is the story of a super fan who uh, gets her favorite author, who has just written a book that she's not a big fan of, uh, locked in her bedroom and puts him through the paces as she makes him write the book that she, the way that she wanted it to be written. Um, it's It's been actually quite a while since I've seen it, but this is Rob... I think this was Rob Reiner's follow-up was it his follow-up to stand by me or was it um yeah it came out in 1990 so yeah right that's right before after stand by me before a few good men um yeah and it's fantastic and remember correct me if i'm wrong this is she won her oscar for this is that right or did yes. she just get nominated yes okay excellent yes. so yeah you know she won an oscar playing a woman who took a bat or took a sledgehammer <gasps> Sledgehammer. Oh, that was gruesome. That is a, I, see, that's the thing about Stephen King. He's always got those things where when you mention them, people make that sound. That because <laughs> nobody does that thing better than him. So no, no, you're right. He's an American treasure. I think a twisted, twisted yes. treasure. <laughs> I, I a love twisted, that movie. messed up treasure. <laughs> yes. I love that movie because uh, when you first meet Kathy Bates and she brings him into the house, like she has such a sweet face, you know, she's so warm and kind and, you know, she's so excited to have him there. She's the biggest fan. And then she reads the book and he killed off the character she loves so much. Right. And then she becomes this demented maniac. And then you're terrified of her. And she's not, not, not a big person. She's like, what, like five, two, maybe. I mean, she's like, right. like a petite woman. But she's terrifying. And you yeah. think about him, like, she's feeding him drugs. You know, he's hobbled because he's ill, but she's also feeding him drugs. Like, he's, like, he's stuck there. And what are you going to do? And yeah. so he just, like, yeah, he, like, hate yeah. writes the books that she wants. And then I love that he sets it on fire. And, oh, it's such a great movie. And as to somebody. Be like, to oh. be, like, you know, at the mercy of yes. someone when you are at your most vulnerable. Right. And it's very and, scary. And it's James Caan. Yeah. So this is like Sonny Corleone, who like, <laughs> you know, beat up a guy in The Godfather, you know, one of the actors. He really right. beat the crap out of him. And here he is, you know, 20 years later, and he's just stuck in a bed. And he does a great job. It's a great performance. Oh, yeah. He does. It's great. I have to wonder, as somebody who is struggling to write a book right now, I have to wonder if I ever had a fan like this, if I was ever lucky enough to have a career, have a fan like this, <laughs> how screwed they would be. I would be in their house for 10 years struggling through what I'm trying to do. <laughs> Even under optimum circumstances, it's taking me forever. I can't imagine that if pretty soon it's just like, no, get out. I don't want the book. Forget it. Forget it. <laughs> Beat it. Jeez, you take forever. You stared at the wall for four hours today. Get out. <laughs> Sorry. Anyway. Just a little insight into your process. That's right. <laughs> that is my pain. That is my scream of pain. So, Margot, thank you so much for joining us for these. Is there anything else? Is there anything else that you would like to say about uh, Stephen King? Oh, my God. It's his birthday coming up. He's going to be 70. Um, happy birthday, Mr. King. You're my favorite writer. Thank you for scaring the crap out of me since I was nine years old. <laughs> it made me tougher. It made me smarter. And uh, I appreciate your work. And where can people find you on the on the Internet, Smargo? So so on the Internet, our show is called Book Versus Movie. And what you do is just type in little search engines where you have your apps uh, for podcasts. And it's just Book VS Movie Podcast. And that's where you'll find us. And on social media, you spell out Book Versus and Movie. And uh, thanks for so much. Please, you know, sign up. Check out our show. Let me know what you think. 
Yes, definitely. Listen to her it's show. It's a great it show. Great. People should listen. Thank For you. Sure. All right. Now we are on to what we are dorking out about this week. <laughs> And that brings us to what we're dorking out about this week. This week, I am uh, very excited that the Emmys are coming. So the Creative Arts Emmy uh, winners were announced on Saturday night. And I know that everyone thinks that that's super lame. But I actually like the Creative Arts Emmy Awards because they, I don't they include a lot of the categories that I really care about. So like animated program was Bob's Burger and documentary special was the 13th on Netflix. Did you watch that? I have you not. watched that. I've oh, my God. Watch about, that. I know. I know. I know. OK. Yeah. And then like documentary series was Planet Earth 2, which I super loved and talked about a ton and are what we're dorking out about like this. These are like these little like nerdier categories that I super love. But also it includes things like the writing category. So. Writing for a variety special went to the Samantha Bee's uh, Not the White House Correspondence Dinner. Um, what else? What else do people care about? Well, you know, that's what it's, no, it's none of it, Sonia. None of it. Uh, Adventure Time won for animated short program. See, I think that's cool. This it's, is the stuff I like. That's you know, it's interesting because this is not because I think people are used to the the Oscars where at certain point. In the night of the Oscars, they say, and, you know, movies aren't Here's just about, stuff. yeah, movies yeah. aren't just about actors and pretty people. It's also about the people behind the camera and the technical achievements that they've done to make these movies so special, blah, blah, blah. And then it's just all the nerds win their Oscars. Right. Uh, and and that what, what they do is they don't have that on Oscar night. They have it like a week or two before. Right. It's like you, we're not going to have you nerds mingle with our big stars. Yeah. We're going to throw you some hot young actress. She'll host it. You guys right. look at her and we're going to give you your technical awards at some other time. I just think, I just love the stuff that these are right shows that we all really enjoy, but they aren't like quote unquote Emmy winners, you well, know, that, like they're not. It's not like a Breaking Bad or a Mad Men or something. It's like these like Bob's Burgers wins something, you know, or this yeah. is where somebody wins an Emmy for their voiceover work. Well, yeah, you that's, know, things like that. Yeah, exactly. The reason I went off on this weird tangent is because this is a mixture of like animated program. Why isn't that in the main story documentary? Why isn't that in the main? Yeah. In the main show like the. You know, variety right. special. There's there's stuff here that I think people would be interested in. Right. Um, but for some reason, it's off on this yeah. ancillary thing. So. so there's a couple other ones here. Unstructured reality program is the United States of the I'm sorry, United Shades of America with W. Kumel Bell. That's oh, a good one. Right. You know, uh, the documentary Beatles eight days a week won something for sound, I think. That's a really great documentary if you haven't seen it. I just watched I, it last week. I need to see that. I've heard it's fantastic. It's on Hulu. It's really great. You know what? That's I think that is the that is a nice thing about these these Emmys is that especially in this day and age when there's just so much stuff out there. I was talking to my sister about it a couple of days ago and it's just impo she was naming all these things that she's paying attention to and watching and they all sound great, but it's like I you know, I think of myself as who consumes more than a normal person's amount of pop culture. And there's just, it's, you know, well, we've talked about it a million times. It's impossible to get in to, to right. talk about how much stuff this is. It's just, yeah, all of this stuff. There's a lot of fantastic stuff that I don't think I'm ever going to see, which is fine, I guess. But, <laughs> um, but yeah. Oh, there's, a, there's other stuff, too, like Variety Special was care carpool karaoke primetime special that's lame i can't believe that one something yeah. structured reality program is shark tank and this one actually this is really cool they do like the emmy for the host of reality and reality show competition programs on uh -huh. this one which i'm kind of surprised they don't do that one in the main show right. uh and the winner was rupaul for rupaul's drag race and right. that's pretty cool which uh 
Yeah. So, so that's what I'm. So that's what I'm dorking out about because I'm such a dork. I care about the Creative Arts Emmys. That's right. No, that's good. That's well, actually, because the other thing is Ezra Edelman for OJ Made in America won for directing a nonfiction program, and I have to wonder, how does that work? How do you have? My understanding from the rules of the Emmy, and I'm sure he's following the rules, is that if something premieres in a movie theater, it's a movie and it's not eligible. But he's, yeah, he know. somehow won an Oscar and an Emmy for the same thing. He's which trying I, to get an EGOT just for one thing. Which which I I admire that. <laughs> oh, man, I admire that kind somehow of Somehow he's... Somehow he's going to get a Tony out of That's this. That's right. I got to say, uh, I will admit, we, we we joke about, or I joke about my Emmys on this show more often than I probably should. Uh, and all, I, I would credit three quarters of my Emmy from re, Emmy wins from just reading the rules, figuring them out, and and submitting correctly. So whoever, actually, it's probably Ezra Edelman. He's he's his game is his rules game is on point. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> he knows exactly what, are you? what he's doing. What are you dorking out about this week? Uh, I am dorking out about the weird entertainment industrial freakout and enter- entertainment industrial gossip complex freakout of uh, Colin Trevorrow being fired from episode nine of Star Wars. Um, there's, you know... There are there are a couple of these big, huge universe movie uh, franchises that are having trouble, and it's always fun and kind of sexy to talk about them. You know, we've we've talked at nauseum about the problems that DC is having bringing their universe of superheroes to the big screen in a satisfying way. We've made jokes about how uh, Universal is kind of pathetic in their hope that they are going to make this dark universe collection of connected movies with Tom Cruise and the mummy and <laughs> Star Wars is getting quite the reputation Lucasfilm and Kathleen <laughs> Kennedy is getting quite the reputation for hiring directors and then getting rid of them uh, started with Josh I, I appreciate Trent. that they don't mess around they don't mess they're around like, they're like this ass ain't working out out get out and and which is what's funny is you, you hear about this, and I've seen a couple – people are starting to write the stories when another one of these things happened. Well, let's, let's see. Let me step back. So Josh Trank got booted out of either the Han Solo movie or the Boba Fett movie a couple years ago. Then uh, Kathleen Kennedy supposedly had some run-ins with J.J. Abrams, which is why he's not coming back. Then Lord and Miller were booted from Han Solo – in the middle of production, which admittedly is pretty unusual. That's, you know, people are going to ask questions when something like that happens. Now, Colin Trevorrow, who directed uh, Jurassic World and was supposed to direct Episode Nine, uh, he's now been fired. He's now been fired. And you get these stories of like, oh, you know, what's wrong at Lucasfilm? It's time for a shakeup. You know, you see these... You see these um, stories, you know, like when uh, Batman versus Superman came out and it wasn't all that good. And then Suicide Squad came out there. You got a rash of stories of what's going on with DC. They're all messed up and they're, you know, pissing off their directors and people, you know, people are leaving and all that. But the thing with DC is their movies are not nearly as successful as they theoretically should be on paper. Right. Star Star Wars and the track record of the people who made them, like you know, uh, Zack Snyder is yeah he made The Watchmen, but he also made uh, what was that Punch Super Punch or uh, Sucker Punch. Sucker Punch, which which was let's just say it wasn't a very well reviewed movie. <laughs> Kathleen Kennedy, three movies. There are three movies that we can, or two movies and one movie we can say have come out of this tumultuous production house so quote unquote tumultuous production house the force awakens which was an insanely huge hit uh rogue one which had oh yeah that's another example where gareth edwards kind of supposedly left production or was had his role minimized when they did a bunch of reshoots on that that movie was a huge success every 
word of mouth, every early buzz on Ryan Johnson's uh, uh, Last Jedi. Last Jedi is that it's hugely satisfying. Disney would love to have him come back to do Episode Nine. So you know you get you get these hang, you know one one pot you know uh, arguably talented director like Colin Trevorrow gets fired and you get all these hand wringing essays. Oh, what are we gonna do? You know we should uh, get rid of Kathleen Kennedy or is it time to shake things up at Lucasfilm? But you look on paper, her track record is unassailable. What I like other... that she is being a guardian for the Star Wars movies. Well, I do too. And here's the thing is you see, let's, let's look at this. There's, uh, so the force awakens comes out. Then rogue one supposedly has this troubled, uh, production, but when the movie comes out, it's fantastic. Then let's look at DC. Uh, Batman versus Superman comes out. It's a pretty divisive film. Warner Brothers freaks out. They order a bunch of uh, reshoots on Suicide Squad, and Suicide Squad comes out, and what is it? It's boring. It's hardly watchable. It's awful. So I I am not one usually to jump to the sexism uh, explanation for what things are, but I, you, I think in a pretty stark relief there was a contingent of the entertainment industrial complex that was letting their sexism or something show a little bit when you're talking about getting rid of Kathleen Kennedy because she's fired a couple of directors when her track record is just you know one of the greatest in Hollywood I think when you know unfortunately it happens like this but when when she eventually passes on and people look back at her body of work and what she's produced they're going to be it's, it, there's going to be some questions like why hasn't she, why wasn't she uh, why doesn't she rank her reputation rank up with the Spielbergs and the Lucases and the uh, Abrams or whatever because what she's done is insane and I just think it, it is very strange to watch this internet freak out you know I guess we've talked I think about- it is I think it is sexism because I think if this was a reversed thing. If there was a man doing all this, people would be like, that's so awesome that he's making sure that star Wars is going to be great. And he wants to keep the integrity of the franchise and, you know, blah, blah, blah. And why doesn't someone do that for DC and all the, you know, I, I really think that. And I think that because it's a woman doing it, I do think that there's kind of this, you know, maybe she should be quiet and let the men make their movies. Maybe there, there is that, and and I don't want to make it because some of what I'm saying, some of the defense of uh, Kathleen Kennedy, it's it, the the condemnation or the second guessing is not uniform around the internet. There are a lot of Kathleen Kennedy defenders out there, and also there were there were these discussions and actually there still are these continuing discussions with DC of like what the hell are they doing over there they can announce all these movies and firing all these guys and directors are walking away and but the thing is and D- the reason I'm bringing up DC is when you look at the track record of the finished movies that have gotten out in the theaters Star Wars is fantastic people are loving it like crazy DC is blood dour whatever underperforming like crazy I mean I think I think uh, the Force Awakens made two and a half times as much money as Batman versus Superman. So Mm -hmm. in, you know, we talk about creativity a lot on this program. We talk about the meaning of creativity a lot in this business, but (laughs) that's not kind of what keeps people employed. The reason Michael Bay keeps making movie after movie after movie is because (laughs) the bottom line is he is making crazy amounts of money for the movie he's making. Her, Her bottom line measured against everyone else, you know, I, I think she's she's going to be fine. I, I, I think it is, there is a ridiculous contingent of the internet that are kind of writing these think pieces about her management of Star Wars. And, you know, people forget back in the early days of Marvel, they were losing directors and changing directors. And mm-hmm. there was, a, there was you know, John, Jonathan Favreau was supposed to be directing the Avengers and he got... He either left or was asked to leave after Iron Man 2. Um, Edgar Wright, he was developed Ant-Man for 10 years, didn't end up making it because he left. Uh, 
Patty Jenkins was supposed to direct uh, Thor, the second Thor movie. She left because, you know, and and there were some discussions about uh, what Ke- Kevin Feige is doing with the directors over there. But, you know, things kind of worked out. And I, I, I think the only thing that I might fault or the only question that I have when it comes to Kathleen Kennedy is why do they keep announcing these directors so early that they then come to these creative differences? It's, it's right. uh, You know, that, that, that I do wonder about why are they announcing these people and then pulling them back or having them get deep into production and then realizing they're on the wrong, the wrong track. That might, that might be an interesting prompt. It definitely is an interesting question of, what the dynamic is there, but the idea that somehow she's mismanaging Star Wars is insane. Uh, but yeah. Anyway, so that's that's hmm. what I'm dorking out about. It's kind of the what what the internet is mad about this week, even though it's a small contingent. But I just right. I, I don't I don't get it. Anyway, so that's a long rambly way of saying. <laughs> here's hoping Ryan Johnson directs the. <laughs> Uh, Star Wars Episode Nine, and be back yeah, here in funny. December. Be back here in December when I crap all over the Last Jedi, and <laughs> I would be very, very surprised. I I would be too, but it's like I don't want to go too far out on the limb because it's funny the way people talk about Ryan Johnson with this movie and how it's going to be such a big hit, and people are already saying it's going to be this third monster hit for Lucasfilm. But you know, none of us have seen it. They ha- they haven't even put out a second trailer yet. So let's Well, it it is going to be a monster hit no matter what. Yeah. In that it's going to make a ton of money. That's true. That's true. So. Anyway, that's what I Anyway. I'm that's so what uh is there anything else that you would like to say before we get out of here? Sony Mansfield. No, I'll just say goodbye. Bye. <laughs> Dorking Out Show is on Twitter at Dorking Out Show, where you can find Chris at Jet Jurgens and Sonia at The Sonia Show. You can read about Sonia's random adventures at thesoniashow.com and track the slow and creeping progress of Chris's novel and his other hijinks at jetjurgens.com. You can find out more about The Dorking Out Show at dorkingoutshow.com. While you're over there, you can support us by giving us a review on iTunes. We have a handy-dandy iTunes link to whisk you right back to 2007 where you can leave your review and five-star rating in iTunes. We'd do it for your podcast. Want to dork out even more? Well, you can sign up for our newsletter where you'll get all the headlines we use as fuel for the show. That's it for this week. Thanks for listening.